Greetings, YouTube. This is Deck Crash, better known as Brandon. All right, it's time for another Defiance review. Once again, I apologize for having waited two episodes before I did another one. I just had life happen to me in a big way. But I'm back, and I'm ready to go ahead and talk about episodes 10 and 11, The Bride Wore Black, and past his prologue. So these are the two episodes leading up to the season finale, which is going to be happening this coming Monday. And after these two episodes, I cannot wait to see what's going to happen. So let's get started while we're uh, talking about the plot overview of the bride, the bride wore black. <coughs> and as you know, I can get these plot overviews from uh, Wikipedia, but I'm also going to be putting in my two cents about everything that's been going on for it. Now. The episode starts with the bachelor party of Alak, where a dead body is being discovered by accident, but no one knows who it is. Tommy recognizes the body by the ring the dead man was wearing. The, the man is Hunter Bell, the previous, owner, the previous owner of the Need Want Bar, an abusive husband of Kenya, who went missing seven years ago. Nolan's first suspicions go to Amanda and Kenya, and for that reason he wants to let the case go, but Tommy, who was helped in the past by Hunter Bell, doesn't want that. He goes back to the place where the skeleton was found to search for any missing clues. Arissa joins him in his research. The two of them discover hair of Liberata in the scene, and they immediately suspect the barman of the need want, Jared, who was working at the bar back when Hunter Bell, when Hunter Bell disappeared. Tommy and Arissa go to Jared's home to question her, but they find her dead. From the way she was killed, they suspect that Daytac is behind the murder, who probably killed Jared because he, because she knew something and didn't want her to talk. No one arrests Daytac, but soon lets, sets him free. Knowing Daytac and how he acts, no one never believed he was a murderer, and only arrest him so he could lead him to the real killer. In the meantime, via flashbacks, we find out that Nikki is not a human, but an indigene disguised as a human. Hunter Bell had witnessed one of her meetings with Doc Ewell, and Nikki, not wanting him to expose her, killed him. Jared witnessed the murder back then. Now that the dead, now that the dead body was found, Nikki kills him too, so he won't talk. When Ewell finds out about Jared's murder, she realizes that Nikki is out of control and she is not acting for the greater good anymore, as she was always saying. Ewell kills Nikki because it's the only way to stop her. Later, Nolan and Tommy find her body in her car. Ewell made it look like a suicide with a note that Nikki supposedly wrote confessing about both murders. Meanwhile, Rafe realizes why Daytac gave us permission to Alak to marry Christy, and he is letting him know after his, that after his death, the mines are not going to Christy, but to the Iraths. Daytac, after hearing that, wants to cut off the wedding. When he tells Alak, Alak goes to Christy's house to let her know about his dad changing his mind. After having a talk with Rafe, Alak decides not to cut off the wedding. The episode ends with the wedding and Nolan and Tommy solving the murder case by finding Nikki's body. Now that Nikki is dead, Yule is the one who has the artifact, and she hides it so that no one can find it. This episode had a lot of twists and turns. Starts off with uh, Alak and his other um, his other Kassathan friends having sort of this weird mock sword fight where they're kind of uh, making saying a whole bunch of uh, things with this bravado, trying basically questioning their manhood, and well. And it was all just for this, like, winning one of the one of the prostitutes at the need want. And when the prostitute starts getting really sweet on Alak, Alak um, kind of tries to, you know, bow out politely. But his friends start, you know, making fun of his masculinity. And, of course, the Castathans have a very loose um, view of sexuality. And that's pretty much been hinted at at a lot of episodes during a lot of these episodes. So anyway, Alak um, and his friend get into a bit of a scuffle and they one of them rams him into the wall and inside the wall they find a human skeleton and of course they later on find out uh, because of, um, I believe it was Tommy, uh, that this guy, uh, Hunter Bell, they, they thought he had just gone missing, they thought he had skipped town, but no, he was actually killed. And they just, they know, knew about it because of the ring on his finger, and also a belt buckle that had HB on it. And then Nolan goes on ahead and launches an investigation into uh, what's going on with Hunter Bell, because Tommy said, you know, Hunter Bell helped him out. Tommy was like this, uh, this hustler, who just kind of wandered into, um, wandered into uh, Defiance, 
and was trying to swindle a lot of people out of their money, Hunter Bell found him out and basically gave him a job at the local sheriff's office. And from that point on, he learned the ropes and became a law enforcement officer himself. That Hunter Bell, though, you see him in all these um, flashbacks, which is what this episode is told through mostly, it shows that he has a, a side that's actually sort of decent, but he's more of a, well, total bastard. <laughs> he is abusive uh, to uh, to uh, Kenya, and, um, and Amanda hated him for it, wanted to off him herself, but Kenya didn't want to have anything to do with that. Kenya at the time was, of course, exhibiting the same symptoms of that battered uh, wife, you know, thought that she could change her husband, you know, loved him, and didn't want to see him hurt, even though he hurt her all the time. Uh, it, it was, you know, a pretty sad sight to see. And, of course, this is one of those types of whodunit cases that each person that uh, Nolan talked to had something of a reason to not like him. Daytack, back before, uh, knew Hunter Bell before he became the big man on, uh, uh, big man in the town, as you know, so to speak when he was still just hosting back alley uh, fights, placing bets. And what happened was he got into a, a, a scuffle because um, Hunter was not letting him in on some of the money. And he, and he uh, got into a fight with Hunter, and Hunter wasn't exactly playing very fair. And that's an interesting thing about Daytac. As horrible a person as he is, he does have a sort of sense of honor in some regards. As much of a sense of honor as a as an organized crime boss could have, he, he runs his businesses, quote unquote, in the town like a godfather of a mafia would run it. If uh, you've been watching this, of course, you see that he has a sort of twisted sense of honor, but it is a sort of sense of honor nonetheless. And one of he, the things that he likes to do is a fair fight. Uh, but then again, when things start getting uh, over hand, he kind of throws that away pretty quickly. So yeah, he's <laughs> he's still a bastard. Uh, so anyway, uh, so of course Nolan, as I was saying, he's you know trying to investigate the uh, the they're trying to investigate the the, the whole the the whole uh, issue of who killed Hunter Bell, and Irissa stumbles upon some some um, some hair from a. Um, which one of those races was it again? A Liberata. And the only Liberata that was around at the time was uh, the, the same bartender at the Need Want. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm reading this uh, overview of the plot. Now, they're saying that the, uh, that the bartender, Jared, is actually a female Liberata. And that just brings to mind this, one, this uh, scene in one of the previous episodes where... Where uh, uh, Nolan is talking about how he did a favor for a Liberata, and it's like, well, she, you know, she was so happy she kissed me. Although I think it was a she. It's kind of hard to tell with those Liberata. <laughs> well, it is true. The Liberata are the short, stocky race, and they all seem to look alike. And they look a little bit like the, if you remember Star Wars: um, Empire Strikes Back, they look almost a little bit like the Ugonauts, little pig-like creatures that were on Bespin. It's what they remind me of. So anyway, they find, they realize that, of course, uh, Jared is the only one who would have known about it. They were going to go and question him, but they find him dead. Well, her, excuse me. They find her dead in her, uh, in her home. And Nolan notices some type of bluish tint to, uh, to her fingertips. And then later on realizes that that bluish tint is, um... It's 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 reminiscent of a of of of, of being uh, poisoned by oxygen. Liberata actually can't breathe oxygen; they breathe nitrogen. And I thought that was pretty cool. Of course, you know, so that was the reason why they're able to survive on Earth with all the other uh, with all the other uh, Votans. You know, I guess the other Votans must breathe oxygen. No, they're not entirely clear on that just yet. But I'm pretty sure we'll find that another time. So, anyway, uh, what happens is that Nikki comes in uh, and into Doc Yule's into Doc Yule's office, 
And Doc, you were through a conversation with Nikki, the, that's the former mayor. I keep saying former mayor and I'm because I'm so bad with names, but it is, her name is Nikki. So anyway, she starts talking to Doc Yule, and the, another flashback is shown where she's t complaining about some pain in her arm and in her leg, and so she starts using some Votan device on her arm. You see, it's, it's almost like it shows like a see-through arm with some strange like wiring with nanomachines and such. Now, at first I thought that she was uh, some sort of cyborg, but then I remembered that Indigenes have cybernetic implants, and of course one of the most recent episodes was about a result of one of those experiments that the Indigenes were, uh, were performing in disguising themselves as humans and imprinting themselves with that human's memories so that they could infiltrate uh, the human race. And so I realized, oh my, you know, I, I didn't realize it before she even said it, I was like, oh my gosh, she's an indigene. And sure enough, uh, Hunter Bell happened to walk in uh, on, uh, on Doc Ewell when she was doing this, and, uh, and Doc Ewell, uh, and, uh, not Doc Ewell, excuse me, Hunter Bell decided, you know, well, you know, I, I've, dis I've discovered this little secret of yours, I wonder how much you could pay me to keep it a secret. And, of course, the uh, former mayor, Nikki, ends up pummeling him to death with a cane, and that was when the bartender walked in. Now, the whole deal is this, and Doc was right, the bartender didn't, uh, didn't want to talk about it, to, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I don't tell anyone. No one liked this guy. A lot of people wanted to see him dead. So the bartender was like, wasn't going to talk, and Doc Ewell knew this and tried to explain to Nikki, because uh, Nikki was saying, well, he, he was going to blow our cover, and Doc Ewell was like, well, you would never have blown our cover anyway, you stayed quiet then, Why, you know, you stay quiet now, you know, and I keep saying he is she. So, uh, at the end of this, oh, I guess, they don't really go into a lot of Ewell's history with Nikki. It's only hinted at in a previous episode, but I guess you almost have realized that Nikki is, had gone crazy, and so she um, did something to stop her heart. First, she injected her with some sort of a some sort of serum or nanotech or whatever that was to freeze her body uh, in place, and then injected her with the poison, and then made it look like she had killed herself by running uh, the car exhaust into her own uh, car and left a nice little note explaining how I, I did it and couldn't live with myself. Now all of this happens surrounding the wedding between Alak Tar and, um, <coughs> and, 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 and uh, what was the name of that girl? Christy. Uh, yeah. So, in Christy McCullough, it's the daughter of Rafe. So, it all ends with Alec marrying Christy. And the whole deal, there's a lot of, uh, the, the whole subplot with this one was very interesting. And that starts off uh, with Christy refusing to wear some strange, um, uh, cast uh, bridal ornament that, that she has to wear over her eyes. And so, uh, but then... Daytac, you know, was furious that she doesn't want to honor her, her custom. She seems to have been in every episode. And this kind of bugs me. Is that you would think that a girl who's in love with, you know, her man and wants to marry him, really, and he, this guy's like from a different culture, you'd think she would do at least a few things to honor his culture as he would do some things to honor hers. And I've never seen in all the episodes leading up to the wedding, they had some little things between uh, Alec and Christy, and every time Alec would bring up some aspect of Castathan culture, she would shy away from it. Now, I'm thinking maybe that's some sort of lead into maybe their marriage not lasting because of the whole cultural differences, and maybe Christy uh, just was too uncomfortable with certain Castathan customs. And, well, I mean, I can't blame her. I'd be a little weirded out the whole family wanted to bathe together <laughs> uh, like they did in that previous episode but this is such a little thing and in the end yeah Christy agreed to go ahead and wear the the um, that artifact I mean it was Stama's mother's and her mother's was sort of a family heirloom 
But what happened is that in this episode, Rafe and Daytac had a little talk at a local restaurant. And, and during this time, uh, Daytac is trying to run for, for the mayor of Defiance, by the way. And he actually has the backing of the Earth Alliance, which is uh, no bueno if, you know what I, if you've seen the episodes leading up to this. And he learns, of course, through Rafe that, hey, I've, uh, that, that Rafe is saying, you know, the mines are on the territory, so, you know, I'm giving the mines back once I pass. I'm not leaving them to my son or my daughter. And, you know, that's pretty big of, uh, of Rafe. But then again, he's also doing that kind of, he, you realize he's doing this also to stick it to Daytac. Because Daytac wants those mines so badly, that was the only reason why he allowed, uh, why he even allowed Alak to marry Christy. But when Rafe pretty much makes it, uh, makes it crystal clear that he's not going to give that, um, the mines to them, Daytac immediately decides to call off the wedding. And Alak lets Rafe know about this, and Rafe is like, don't you worry about a thing. Y'all are still gonna get married. And, of course, they do. Despite the fact that Daytac doesn't want any, and Stama has this way of sweet talking her husband, and you kind of gotta wonder if she's doing this to either manipulate him or if she's doing it because she's really trying to assuage his anger. It's impossible to know what that woman is thinking. And I love that character, because I'm never entirely sure what she's going to do next. But there's one thing about Stama, is she always has an ulterior motive. Daytac is sort of the, the, the weapon. But Stama is most certainly the brains behind this weapon. And it's kind of interesting, I think that it, the whole deal is playing out, is that Daytac knows about... Um, about what Stama is doing, you know, that she is telling him what he needs to do. And his, though his pride would never allow him to admit that, yeah, he's pretty much uh, not very bright and is taking orders from her, she doesn't mind and just keeps on doing it. Now, the whole deal is... is a little more about this is revealed in the next episode. So, what did I think about this one? I really like this episode. I like a, a, I like a bit of a whodunit. And, yeah, the one who really did it came out in left field. I mean, I didn't realize that the former mayor, Nikki, was an evil, evil woman. But I didn't realize it would go to this. And I was kind of surprised that they took her out of the picture so quickly. Now, I get the feeling that we probably haven't seen the last of her, but I'm not sure. This seemed pretty final. And also the fact uh, that it finally concluded the whole deal with the events leading up to Alak and Christie's wedding. But the next episode, we're gonna, as we're going to see, is kind of a result, is sort of what happens after. Story-wise, like I said, great story. It really propelled the story forward. I mean, now we have Doc Yule who owns that shiny artifact. And we still, I'm still not sure what's going to happen with that. And we have uh, Alak and Christy married. And it's, I'm wondering, you know, what they're going to do with that. This series is thus far doing a really good job because... They don't resort to a lot to well. What they do is they they can they fit in the exposition with the story fairly well because obviously all these things that are going on have a big history behind them. Of course, because we start the whole series off in defiance, long after the Pale Wars are done, after the Ark Falls happened, and a human race is trying to live alongside seven alien races that just kind of barged in on their doorstep. So you have a hotbed of action in the middle of a really wild part of what used to be the United States, which is completely unrecognizable. And it's really doing a good job of telling good stories that take place in this and also having good overarching plots. 
characterization did a great job, especially that scene with Doc Yule at the end when she's setting up the the uh, the former mayor for Nikki uh, to to die. And all Doc Yule saying, "Look, all I wanted to do was when I came to this town, I wanted a fresh start. You know, I, I wanted to leave the past behind, maybe even right some of the wrongs I made. But no, you want to keep on, you know, doing what you were doing constantly for this so-called greater good. You've lost your way. I'm I'm not the person I used to be." You know, I've done some despicable things, but now here I have a chance to better myself. I'm a healer now. I help people. You want to continue doing the same same garbage that you've been doing before. I can't let that happen. I'm sorry, but I have to put an end to this. And this made my respectometer for Doc Yule grow even more. She is turning out to be one of my favorite characters. She has that gruffness and bluntness and straightforwardness that reminds me so much of Dr. McCoy from the original Star Trek. But also, she has that, she has a, a, a heart, but yet you're never sure what she's trying to do. And that's going to carry up to the next episode. <laughs> so, and also, it did a little bit more explaining about the cultures of some of the aliens, and biology, especially given the Liberata, which I actually uh, was interested in. They focus so much on the Castathans and the Arathians, and they've done so much of that in, you know, through the majority of this season. And so, I'm glad to see more things going on involving some of the other races like the Indigenes and the, and the Liberata. So, this episode, to me, gets a solid 9.10. 9, 9 out of 10, excuse me. So, uh, now that that's all done, we're going to move on to the next episode, which is Past this Prologue. <coughs> and as uh, before, you can find these plot descriptions on Wikipedia. They're pretty well made, although I haven't, I'm having to read around a lot of the, the names. So, let's go ahead and dive right in. <coughs> During the public debate between Daytac and Amanda, Nolan shoots and kills the young Castathan aiming a rifle at the stage. However, the apparent assassination attempt is revealed to be a prank set up by Alak and the dead shooter, one of his friends. The event makes people question Nolan's position as the law keeper of defiance. Daytac seizes the opportunity to oust Nolan as law keeper. Secretly contacting the Earth Republic, he digs up dirt on Nolan's past as a Marine in the Pale Wars. He then publicly broadcasts his finding via the radio station as Nolan tries to make amends with the dead youth's family. Nolan, after seeing his past coming to light, goes to Amanda's office and resigns. Later, he confronts Daytac and they get into a fight. Irissa stops Nolan just short of killing Daytac and the two des decide to leave Defiance. Alak ponders his role in his friend's death since his father was the one who suggested the prank. He asks his father why he suggested it, knowing that Nolan would probably kill him. However, his parents stop him from inquiring further. Later, Alak tries to give his respects to the friend's parents, to his friend's parents, but they reject him. While out, he is assaulted by a group of men on Rafe's order. He warns Alak that he is disappointed in him for what he did, and is beginning to quest question letting him marry Christy. He leaves Alak saying that the next time he disappoints him, he will have him killed. Meanwhile, Kenya goes to the Tar residence to see Shtama. Kenya accuses her of knowing that Daytac set up Nolan, asking how she can love a man who'd sacrifice an innocent child for his own gain. Shtama explains that she loves Daytac because of how cold and ruthless he is for not being kind. Daytac berates her for being just like excuse me, Kenya berates her for being just like Daytac and threatens to expose their relationship to the town, doing it to hurt Shtama rather than to affect their respective families' political standings. Shtama acts unfazed to dissuade Kenya, knowing how damaging the truth would be to her reputation in marriage, turning her back on, turning her back on her. Daytac meets an Earth Republic official planning to grant ER the town mines once once uh, he becomes the new mayor in exchange for their support. Yule, meanwhile, is making some kind of experiments on the gold artifact she took from Nikki. In the process, she finds that the artifact is connected to Orissa, uh, causing her great pain each time it's activated. Nolan and Orissa, as Nolan and Orissa prepare to leave, Yule activates the device. Orissa collapses, and Nolan brings her to Yule's office. After telling Nolan to stay outside, she operates on Orissa's back and finds strand-like appendages coming out of her and connecting with the ones com coming from the gold artifact. During the operation, Orissa has a vision of when she was a kid, showing an object identical to the gold one but silver melding with her body. Awakening, she fights Yule and escapes. <clears throat> 
No one enters the lab finding it ruined, Yule on the floor, and Arissa gone. The episode ends with Arissa chasing a girl she had seen in her vision and collapsing. She is found by Rin, who debates whether or not to kill her after what Nolan did to Sukar, while the girl from Erisa's vision watches in the distance. This episode really sets up the events for the final episode. So you have the whole mayoral election in full swing, and Daytac is debating Amanda, is about to do a big public debate for Amanda. Now, Daytac, in the beginning, the, the, this, this plot overview kind of tells things a little bit backwards. It starts off with Daytac still pretty miffed about um, Christie's flaunting of, uh, of uh, Cassethan tradition and not wearing the headdress thing. And so he has his son make this public apology in a formal Castathan way, which is pretty humiliating to him. And so he, his father says, "Well, my my forgiveness is going to come at a price." And so says, I'm, I'm, "I need you to come. I need you to do something." And dur so during the debate, uh, this ha that's on this rainy day and people with umbrellas all over the place, where Nolan is and and Tommy and Arissa are basically assigned as guards. For, for the whole deal. The, um... Oh, yeah. Nolan spots someone up, up uh, on, the, on the top of a building, on, like, a balcony, aiming something at the mayor. Now, what happened is that... Is that, uh, Alak is telling one of his friends, you know, you know here, you know, check this out, you know, it, it, I want you to do this, you know, I can't, it can't, it can't be traced back to me, and this is obviously a thing that his father told him to do, and so he, he gives the kid the, this package, he's like, take, get it right between the eyes, and he opens the package, and you think it's a gun, and so he, so, uh, Nolan, during the debate, sees, sees that, uh, Cassethan kid up on the balcony, and he's about to shoot, and he, you know, makes a call, and shoots the kid, and the kid dies, and they find out that it was just a paintball gun. Now, this, of course, has the whole town in a tizzy, and, of course, as the plot review I just read said, uh, Daytac is taking advantage of this uh, by going on public radio from the Arch, where his son works, and playing back this, um, this trial piece where Nolan, back when he was still a Marine during the Pale Wars, is making all these racial epithets against, uh, against, the, uh, against the Votans. You know, uh, causing the causing a lot of the alien population, the Votan population, the defiance to turn against him, and so Nolan decides to resign his commission because he realizes that if I stay, he's telling him, if I stay, you know, you're going to lose this election, and, and if I leave, I, I you know, I don't want to. He makes a really cool speech saying, you know, I don't want to be the one who I love this town. I don't want to be the one who kills it. You know, you need to be able to beat Daytac on your own. I'm going to, I'm going to mess up your chances. So he decides to leave with Arissa. But right before that happens, he goes and finds Daytac and beats the living crap out of him. <laughs> but of course, Arissa stops him just short of killing him. And <laughs> Daytac, <laughs> you, know, you gotta love him. He's at least you could one thing you could say is he is full of salt because he's just like he's like what's what's the matter? No kid to use some um, he uses uh, a Castathan word. I don't remember how he said, but I'm pretty sure he was saying no kick to the head. It was like you know what? You no know, kick to the head. Arissa just stops, walks back to him, pop, <laughs> puts his lights out. That was that was one of the beautiful moments in that series. It was so satisfying to watch Daytac get get these stuff and beat out of him. So, uh, so he, um, before he decides to leave, though, um, he, Arissa starts going to these spasms. Now, I'll get back to that in just a moment. But the whole deal, this story, this particular episode revolves a lot uh, around Alak. And this kind of exposes, and this was something I suspected in the previous few episodes, but really comes to light in this episode, is that Alak is really spineless when it comes to his dad. But, you kind of can't blame him. His dad's a really scary guy, and even he admits that to one of his friends. And I think, and, and after what, after learning that it was Alak who did this, and most likely on his own dad's orders, yeah, Wraith... Macaulay is is um 
understandably uh, a, a little pissed. And so <coughs> he uh, he has like his, he has some guys kind of rough him up, and he tells him, you know, he does pretty much say like, I'm really disappointed in you. You know, I'm kind of wondering, you know, if it was a good idea to let you marry my daughter. And because you know you're sitting there doing what your dad told you to do, just to mess up, you know, the, the, you know, just to manipulate the people. You know, I thought you were better than that. I said, please don't do this again, because. And he said it like this. He said, if you disappoint me again, I'm gonna make sure that you're not married to to Christy anymore. And I don't believe in divorce. <laughs> this 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 series is putting up some pretty interesting one-liners thus far. So yeah, now. Nolan is disgraced in the eyes of the town. He's leaving with Orissa. Now, the whole deal is this. This episode opens up with a with an experiment that Docu is performing with that gold device. I he she sets it up in some some part of her lab where she has these these devices and one looked like a Volge cold fire weapon. Um, that's firing on this uh, on this device, and the device starts unleashing these weird tendril-like things. And this whole deal uh, takes place during this part where uh, Tommy and Arissa are uh, <laughs> getting a little, you know, getting a little tender. And all of a sudden, she's complaining she can't feel her legs, and she she's in horrible pain. And so they take her to, the, to Doc Yule, and Doc Yule does like something like an X-ray. But later on, you know. They, what happens is Rissa is able to walk in, she, she's fine, and she starts seeing visions of herself as a child running around, she's following those visions. And during the incident, during the debate, Rissa wandered off, following one of those visions, she goes into Doc Ewell's office and starts tearing up all these plants that she had around the, the secret locker that she had. But she obviously couldn't get in, Doc Ewell had the key and everything, and it's a pretty, a, a pretty uh, secure lock, it has several different kinds of locks on it. And Docu goes back into her office and sees someone had ransacked him, and she frantically opens up the, the locking me mechanism and reaches inside, and that's where she's keeping the device. And she's like, you know, really relieved to see it's still there. And Arissa's kind of feeling bad about having left her post, uh, even though it was because of some vision that she's had, which she's been having a lot of as of late. So... <clears throat> what happens later on is that I think Doc Yule, who's you know, pretty clever... She's kind of putting two and two together, and what she does is she uses the x-rays, whatever that thing is. It doesn't look like an x-ray. It looks like a white piece of paper with some strange, it, with a, a readout of, um, of Arissa's insides on it. And she puts the paper in this tube and pours some sort of a chemical in there, shakes it up, and pulls it out again, and puts it up back on the whiteboard that, where she had it. And these strange spiraling images start appearing on it, and these weird patterns. And so that next night, she performs the experiment again, just as Arissa and Nolan are preparing to leave, the defiance never come back. And when it happens, sure enough, Arissa collapses, screaming in pain and saying she can't feel her legs. And so Doc Ewell, you know, takes her in and she, she pulls open her shirt and sees these strange crawling things, and you got a glimpse of that on her back when uh, the opening scene of the story with her and uh, Tommy. And I was kind of wondering, you know, what's that on her back? Looks like some weird worms or something. I was wondering what that was. And so she's telling uh, Nolan, you know, she's got some sort of Votan parasite, I need to get out of her right now, we need to operate, get out, get out, get out. And during that time, and, and, and so during that time, she, she puts her under anesthetic and cuts her open. And while she's still got that wet, that the, the device experimenting with it, these the tendrils start coming through the ceiling, the gold tendrils, and these silver tendrils start rising up from her body. And during this time, Arissa's having these flashbacks of when she was a child, but that weird cult that she saw several episodes back. And they put another device on her back, which looks like the gold device, but silver, and it like it it, it 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 fuses with her body. So more and more wondering what is this thing? <laughs> and Arissa suddenly has a vision of that girl which is a vision of herself as a child and it wakes her up. And Nolan's standing outside Docule's uh, 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 you know Docule's um, um, uh, office you know, is, is, you know, 
wondering what's going on, and then all of a sudden you hear all this crashing, and Doc, and Doc Yule screaming, and so he busts in there and sees Doc Yule uh, propped up against the wall, hurt, but still alive, and Arissa nowhere to be found. And the closing scene shows Arissa staggering through the forest, and then she comes upon Rin. Now, Rin was that one, um, that Arathian that tried to unleash those hell bugs on Defiance. And Rin just kind of stands there and, like, and says, I know, you know, what your, after what your father did to, uh, to Sukar, I'm kind of wondering whether or not to kill you. And the whole thing, the whole time you see, um, her, um, Iris's back still cut open, so she's losing blood or something like that, and she's still seeing those visions of herself as a child, and just kind of watched right there, and that's how the episode ends. And so, kind of wondering what's going on now. Oh, and by the way, and I forgot to say, yeah, as we know, Daytac is in bed with the Earth Alliance, and they're making those plans to. Is, they're pretty much talking about you know what they're going to do once Daytac is mayor. Because the Earth Alliance is actually who gave him that transcript of Nolan's trial and, 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 in, and inquiry or whatever that was. And so they're talking about, well, when, you know, when you're mayor, you know, what we'll do is we'll say the Rathians have no real claim to the mines. And so I'll have a claim to them and then we, you can go ahead and just and just will them to you. And so already Daytac is, is in bed with the Earth Alliance. <laughs> and I'm just, and so it really, there really is a, a real element of uncertainty here in that particular arena. I mean, it really at this point looks like it could be very likely that they tackle win. They're not really telegraphing anything like a lot of other shows that I've seen in that kind of a situation do. It could be very well that Daytac may win the election and something might end up happening. Uh, that causes uh, Rafe McCauley to lose those minds. And it would make things very interesting for Defiance, but maybe something might happen at a later point which causes Daytac to have to relinquish Defiance back to Amanda. But of course, that's all to be seen. Hopefully, in the next episode, hopefully, it won't, that episode won't live in, li uh, will not end on a cliffhanger. That will keep us waiting for what's going to happen next in the next season. And as and uh, in case you didn't know, Defiance has been greenlighted for a second season for 2014. So I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. This episode is a really cool. After that episode from the previous one, it's like telling all the different things that are happening. It really, I was wondering if they were going to pick up where they left off, because Defiance has a, a way of being very unpredictable with their episodes. They'll show a plot point or a plot device and might let it sit for a couple of episodes, or sometimes they jump right into it the very next one. So you never know what you're going to get. And it makes this series exciting. And I don't know about you, but this is really why I love it. It's something really unusual. And I can't wait to see what happens in the next episode. Uh, they don't really do a whole lot of intrigue into the to, into the alien cultures, except on a few small levels uh, where, like I said, Alec had to do that weird uh, apology thing to his father, and also the fact that Nolan tried to make amends with the with, with the family of Daytac's friend. And there's a special, there's a particular Tacastathan um, uh, way of, 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 of doing it in their own language. So it does delve a little bit into that culture. But it really also was a good character-based uh, episode of that series. Really showed some character development of Nolan showing just how much he's grown to love this town. He loved it enough to not want to let it die, and to give Amanda a fighting chance, realizing he has to let go of being the local lawman. And it tore himself up inside, you know, about making that call involving that Cassadan boy. And I, even during that scene, I was like, you know, I, I can't blame Nolan. I would have probably done the same thing. You're seeing a guy with a gun on a balcony aiming it for the mayor, and, you know, it, what's going to go through your head isn't uh, that, what kind of a gun is it? You're looking, guy with gun, gotta stop him. 
You know, could he have tried for a non-lethal hit? Maybe. But he's a soldier born in, you know, well, not, maybe not born and bred, but he's a soldier, trained soldier. And what's the soldier going to be trained to do if he's going to see a sniper? He's going to take out the sniper with extreme prejudice. <sighs> so I'm hoping that this isn't, it will, though it wouldn't, it wouldn't be surprising, but I'm hoping this isn't going to, the next episode is not going to focus on Nolan beating himself up so much. But it still leaves a lot of wondering what's going to happen next. And I most certainly can't wait. And so this episode, another good solid 9 out of 10. And, you know, the next final episode of the, of the season is coming Monday, I believe. Uh, let me make sure about that that, uh, let me see, July 8th, yep, so that's coming uh, Monday, so uh, we'll see what's going to happen uh, there, and until uh, next time, everybody, I hope uh, to hear your comments, you know, comment, rate, subscribe, I want to see what you thought about these episodes, and once again, I deeply apologize for taking so long with this, I had every intention to do episode 10 separate from episode 11, but... Like I said, life got in the way. But hey, next episode, episode 12, well, that's the final episode of the of the season, so yeah, I'm only going to be doing that one episode. So it'll be noticeably shorter. And so I hope you enjoyed this, guys. Comment, rate, subscribe. As always, keep it civil. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And once again, this is Dad Crash, better known as Brandon. And as always, stay lucky and stay blessed. Take care.